Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How are we? It is delightful to be back. It's a little cloudy over here in Canterbury, um, and it is, goodness me, what time is it? 7 p.m. Over on the eastern seaboard, I understand it's 2 p.m., but it's 4 a.m. in Australia, and we're going all the way to Melbourne to say hi to James Kennedy. James, hi. How are we doing? Fantastic. Thank you very much. So I understand you're keeping awake on, on herbal tea. Is that right? It's, it's green tea and I've got chocolate. It's actually very early in the morning here. Well, listen, there are an awful lot of people waiting to hear about you to name but a few. We've got Deborah Bennett, we've got Charlene Jett, we've got Kelvin Angara, we've got Elizabeth Isaac, and my goodness, how many people are here today? Uh, 677 and counting, and they're all dying to hear about chemophobia. So I'm going to pass it over to you. Take it away, mate. So thanks for the introduction. I want to remind everybody, it's 4 a.m. in Australia, so I'm giving this lecture in my garage. It's, uh, it's cold and it's a bit uh, dark and eerie, but it's actually a perfect setting for our topic today. I'll remind you there was a time when people actually loved chemistry a little bit more than they do today. People appreciated the effects and the, the benefits of chemical products, and then this happened. And then these three things happened. And I'll leave you with that image. I just want you to think about what are those three objects, and I will show you today in the presentation. Now we're left with things like this, chemical-free everything, fad diets where they demonize one particular type of chemical. And you've, of course, uh, probably heard of a, a fellow Australian, um, Bell Gibson, who made essentially what is a kind of a chemophobic diet uh, and uh, eventually was exposed for fabricating the entire thing, and she's uh, now in uh, big trouble for it. But this cartoon here is from the Royal Society of Chemistry, and it represents not what the public actually feels towards chemistry, but what we as chemists misconstrue the public's perception to be. In other words, we actually have a much better reputation than we give ourselves credit for. The chemical industry is uh, not doing as badly as we think. Now, chemophobia is the irrational fear of compounds perceived as synthetic, and perceived as synthetic is a crucial part of the definition, because if we don't agree as chemists that chemicals are perceived as synthetic, then chemophobia becomes the fear of everything, if everything's a chemical. So that's clearly nonsensical. We have to start at the outset with an agreement that chemicals are perceived as synthetic, and I have evidence for that. So chemophobia is a non-clinical phobia. What does that mean? It doesn't cause clinical anxiety. You don't see people turning over a shampoo bottle and literally having a panic attack because they've read the label uh, and they're that scared. So it's, it's really just a, an, an aversion, a choice that people make, and that really works in our favor because it can be cured by the spread of more or better quality information. By spreading more information about chemicals, about chemistry, we can cure chemophobia and make people feel empowered enough to make more informed choices. We have to also address the elephant in the room, uh, and that is the fact that chemists are, and I've put partly responsible on the slide, we're actually largely responsible for chemophobia, and it really works in three ways. The first way is whenever something new is introduced to the public, people some of them, some people will oppose it. That's just the nature of humanity. We, when something new is introduced, some people will embrace it, most will ignore it, and some will uh, just naturally oppose it, just because it's new. The second way that we have caused chemophobia is through certain industrial accidents. Those molecules I showed you have caused disasters which have eroded the trust that the public has for chemistry as an industry. But the third thing is, there's one massive thing that we have failed to do as an industry, and that other sciences have overtaken us in this, and it's education and outreach. We've really neglected it. In a way, some chemists even maybe look down on it. It's an afterthought, but that is one thing that has actually allowed chemophobia to balloon out of proportion. Firstly, a good place to start is the Royal Society of Chemistry's report. If you haven't read it, do read it. It's a fantastic report on what the public thinks of chemistry. They did a, a free word association experiment. What do you think of when, when I say the word chemistry? They asked over 2,000 people, representative of the UK population, and number one and number two were school and teacher, respectively. Now, I'm a school teacher, and for me, that's, that says something. That says that students go through school learning chemistry as an academic discipline, seeing the periodic table of elements on the wall, but never really see the connection between the theory in their books, the periodic table of elements, and their everyday lives. Effectively, they don't see that medicine, perfumes, brushing their teeth, cooking. They don't see that this is all chemistry. Chemistry for them is the methodical, serious, very boring, difficult academic textbook subject and bears no relevance to real life. One of the reasons, I think, is we focus a lot when we do do outreach on elements. And there's some great books and some great uh, TV shows on elements, but 
when's the last time you actually saw an element in your daily life? Most of these words are negative or neutral. Medicine's the only positive ones, so it doesn't paint a great picture of the attitudes towards chemistry. Um, you tend to get, however you ask the question, a 20-60-20 split. So 20% of people are generally very positive towards chemistry, and I'm probably going to say that you are all in that category there as an audience. 20% of people have generally a negative attitude towards chemistry, but for me, there's an elephant in the room right there. 60% of people are neutral towards chemistry, and they're the ones we should be focusing on. And we'll talk about that today. We're lagging far behind the other sciences. 4.3 out of 10 is how engaged people are in chemistry. The most common response, sadly, was one out of 10. That most people are being turned off by chemistry, and yes, I am partly to blame for that, as the, as the school system does tend to put people off. Okay, so chemicals actually are seen in a slightly more positive, yet slightly more polarized light. So most people do understand that everything is made of chemicals. Most people do understand that everything can be toxic, and most people do understand that natural things are not always safer. Chemists, though, have a fantastic reputation. The Royal Society of Chemistry Report suggests that we are enjoying probably the best reputation we've ever had as people. So we really need to leverage this platform that we've got to lift up the reputation of chemistry and chemicals, respectively. That works in our favor. It's much, much easier to build understanding than it is to build trust. We already have trust. But why bother? As a scientist, as long as you can get into the lab, do your work, publish your papers, and aim for a Nobel Prize, you're probably doing okay, right? Why would you care what ordinary people think about chemistry? Well, actually, it does matter, and it matters in three main ways. First, we have a moral duty to give back to the public, and that's the, the most common uh, misconception of outreach, that we have to just give back to the public and there's no more to it. But there's more than that. When the public cares about chemistry and science, they elect politicians who care about chemistry and science, and science funding comes largely from the perception of chemistry that, that the politicians have, so that's actually feeding into the long-term health of our industry. So we have a vested interest, really, to make sure that the public and politicians are actually aware of science and chemistry. But even more than that, it helps us to clarify the meaning of our own work. When we get feedback from the general public, we get the most interdisciplinary audience you'll ever get. When you speak to the, the, the general public, you get backgrounds very diverse, more diverse than any group of scientists, and they will give you opinions that the science community never can. It's important to speak to the science community, absolutely, but when you speak to the public, you gain something extra, and as a scientist, you have to really engage with that if you're not doing already. So my question for you is, which one of these two glasses would you rather drink? And here is our first poll. We'll give you a few moments to select the right answer. All right, I want to take you to Seattle. This is Bill Gates, and he's drinking water, which five minutes ago was raw sewage. It comes from the Janiki Omni processor plant. Fantastic contraption. It's a prototype plant that converts sewage into clean drinking water, electricity, and ash. Three valuable products. And it's designed to be rolled out into the rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa that need these sanitation, and they need clean drinking water, they need electricity. It's designed to be rolled out there, and it's really a win-win-win-win for everybody involved. Everybody should be for it, right? Well, unfortunately, Paul Rosen did a survey with a show that, again, roughly that 20% figure was so against the idea, they said it would be impossible for the water to ever be clean enough that I want to drink it. They didn't trust the technology, and they were so afraid that they would never want to drink it. But Bill Gates, of course, has a more positive view. He says, it's water, I'd happily drink it every day. But it's interesting, we knew the results before we asked this question, of course, and it shows that even in the most rational of situations where we have the most rational of audiences present, we still see a slight tendency to vote towards the one from Mountain Spring. What does that mean? Well, it shows that we all have this slight innate propensity to become chemophobic, and here is why. We've evolved to become prone to chemophobia. Paul Rosen, who we saw earlier, he did the, the, the survey, he studies contagion, and he actually coined the term contagion in this context. He gives the example of this in one of his papers. He says, you're at a wedding, big banquet, there's a platter on the table, and you can imagine this beautiful platter of salad. Now, let's imagine a cockroach runs across that salad. Would you now want to eat that salad? Probably less than you did before. But now let's have another example. Same banquet, same situation, but the platter now is a platter of cockroaches. And somebody wafts a salad leaf 
over the cockroaches. Has the salad leaf made you want to eat the cockroaches? Well, no, of course not. What does this mean? It shows that dirt and disgusting things contaminate clean things, not the other way around. Just like light overcomes dark, because dark is the absence of light, dirt is a physical entity, and cleanliness is the absence of dirt. So dirty things are able to contaminate clean ones, but not the other way around. We have a negative bias in that sense. Mark Schaller expanded on this. The behavioral immune system is the set of behaviors that we have that are innate that allow us to avoid things that might make us sick. So we perceive situations like a cockroach running across a salad, and we avoid the entire platter because it might make us sick. And it's a very useful evolutionary adaptation. We've evolved this, and it's kept our species alive. But it's overly sensitive, for good reason, but it's overly sensitive. We've all got something we don't eat, for example. Watermelon is a very common food that we maybe don't want to eat. And the reason is it maybe it's summer. Once you cut the watermelon open, if you don't put it in the fridge, it goes badly very it goes bad very easily. Some people who don't like watermelon have had a bad experience with watermelon. Maybe one of them made them sick. But a common response to that is something like, oh I don't like melon. Not just I don't like watermelon or I don't like bad melons, but we form an aversion to things that resemble the original trigger, not just the trigger itself. So a fear of chemicals could be brought about by possibly the excessive use of chemicals or the inappropriate use of chemicals such as this. And people may form an aversion to all synthetic chemicals as a result of something like the spraying of DDT. Who's most prone to this? Well, Megan Oten did a fantastic uh, meta-analysis of different studies. She showed that basically women in their 30s, women of childbearing age are most prone to chemophobia. The food babe army, if you like, are most prone to chemo. All the fitness bloggers that are in that kind of demographic, the ones who you know Instagram about their uh, clean eating habits, etc. There was another study that actually showed pregnant women are more likely to be averse to uh, disgust and uh, contamination, and hence chemophobia. And especially people who are pregnant in the first trimester, this was not in the meta-analysis, but another paper showed the first trimester they were more prone to chemophobia than other times. So basically, we've evolved to be most risk-averse when we're most vulnerable, which makes perfect sense. So marketers are actually playing to this fear of chemicals, and they're giving us things like uh, the label on the left on a moisturizer, no SLS, no SLES, no harsh detergents. Why are they saying no SLS on a, on a moisturizer? by the way, I was doing some analysis in the pharmacy, the first product I pick up is this, no SLS on a moisturizer, you shouldn't have SLS on a moisturizer, it's settled science that SLS left on skin for a long time causes increased water loss, redness, dryness, itching, etc. So while it's not an incorrect claim to say it's got no SLS, it's implying that the other products on the shelf from other brands do have SLS, and that's Essentially, they're getting through a little bit of a legal loophole here by making implications about the others. Sometimes the label is simply wrong. This product contains sulfates in the middle, but it foamed. That was withdrawn from sale by the Trading Standards Agency. And we've got a whole wealth of chemical-free products. Now, chemical-free is a problem. Chemical-free is a claim that we have to fight, but not because everything's a chemical. Chemical free is a problem because chemical, by definition, is an artificially purified or extracted compound. Now, this contains extracts of all different kinds, so chemical free is not applicable. It almost never is, but we'll come back to that. So they also claim that some things are natural. Here's an example of something that's uh, really not natural, but claims to be, contains artificial ingredients. By the way, natural is a bit of a legal loophole as well. You've got uh, no definition of natural, really, in the US or Australia. You can put natural on almost anything you want. In the UK and Canada, it has a stricter definition. All right, my question for you. Have a look at this label. What's wrong with it? Over to you. Time for our second poll. Which response do you think is right? It's interesting. They're actually all incorrect claims. And uh, in the UK, especially, they're more strict about this. Pure, we know what pure means as a chemist. It's essentially one ingredient that's not as best as we can make it. It's one ingredient. Um, this product has about 12 ingredients. It's not pure. Nor is it natural, because body wash does not occur in nature. And, and organic, of course, if you actually add up the amount of organic, I don't know if you could read the ingredients list, it's very small, but if you add up the concentrations of the organic things, it comes to 20%. So 20% organic is not organic. I just want to take you through some of the different types of chemophobia and all of these. We've got anti-vaxxers, the first chemophobes, if you like. Anti-vaxxers are interesting because they're as old as vaccinations themselves. 
There's evidence of anti-vaxxers going right back to the first vaccines in 1798, and their first argument was, vaccines don't work. Now, when that myth was debunked, they started saying things like, smallpox vaccine turns you into a cow, and we even got a cartoon from 1802 of literally people turning into a cow. They're very scared and they're being injected and growing cow parts out of their faces. In 1885, we had a massive demonstration. There were tens of thousands of people present in Leicester in, uh, in England. And there was an anti-vaccination demonstration. And their arguments just evolved. They said things like it's an erosion of our civil liberties. And now they're saying things like they, can't, they contain mercury. They, their arguments just evolve over time. But what's interesting is they didn't have any scientific arguments from the very outset. They opposed them from day one. Organic food is another kind of chemophobic group. And this is interesting for me because it was actually sparked, ironically, by uh, an act that chemists did. They introduced DDT into the environment in 1939. Almost immediately afterwards, this book got written. This book became the foundation of organic farming. He didn't use the word organic farming. This book grew into the organic movement. Now, there's a misconception out there that organic crops are not sprayed with anything which is actually not true. Many of them are sprayed with certified organic pesticides and uh, insecticides and herbicides, etc. Next group is the anti-fluoridation movement, and these again have roots going right back to the first days of fluoridation. They opposed it from day one, not because they were scared of the chemical, the fluoride itself, but because they had all sorts of arguments. It's a communist plot that was from the 60s. It goes against our libertarian values, was way back in the 40s. They've had arguments from day one against this, Paleo diet originated as a response in the 1980s to the growing amount of evidence in the US that actually bad diet and junk food was contributing to heart disease, to diabetes, uh, and other ill health. So in 1985, one researcher just said, well, Paleolithic people didn't have these aff afflictions, so, so how about we eat like them and we can solve the problem? It was really a, a hypothesis that maybe we should consider, but it grew into the paleo movement. And I've had a look at some paleo recipes. It's supposed to be what we ate 10,000 years ago, but I find this interesting because I see orange carrots there. Orange carrots did not exist 10,000 years ago. Broccoli didn't exist 10,000 years ago. Brussels sprouts didn't exist 10,000 years ago. And tomato sauce, ketchup, definitely did not exist 10,000 years ago. I'd also like to know which particular community of Paleolithic people had access to both avocados from Mexico and black pepper from India to sprinkle together in the top right there. So these, these look like very nice meals, I must admit, but they're, they're not particularly scientific. They are a fad diet. The anti-GMO movements, and have roots right back to day one. When the first GMOs were introduced into the public, they were destroyed by protesters as soon as they were put into the environment. The chemtrails group as well has roots back to something a chemist did as well. So this is all real evidence that chemists actually have planted the seeds of chemophobia, and the public has then taken those little pieces of evidence and ballooned them out of proportion into these different uh, chemophobic groups. The chemtrails group is, uh, is it's got to be my favorite because they're very fragmented. They don't really have a coherent theory, but they do have all sorts of conspiracies about what chemists are doing to them. If you just summarize all of these, we're approaching zero lag between the introduction of a new chemical technology to the public and opposition movements arising. They're not forming opposition arguments based on science. They're forming arguments on day one, and that can only be an opposition because the thing is new. Not because it's dangerous, not because it's going to have some long-term health effects, but because it's new. So they're not fearing these things because they're actually scared of chemicals. Chemophobia really has roots in the fear of things that are new. And because science is constantly making things that are new and discovering things that are new, they're really opposing science. If they oppose science, we can't expect to use scientific arguments to persuade them otherwise. And if we try that, they simply discount our arguments, discredit our arguments, and find a new argument to back up their pre-existing prejudice. If all we speak is science, then maybe we shouldn't actually engage with these groups at all. But these are all in the negative category down here. For me as a chemist, I want to focus on that neutral category there. That is an elephant in the room. 60% of people are uninformed, not interested in chemistry, and they're the ones we should be speaking to. As chemists, our time is much better spent on that neutral category, who is much more homogenous, has no existing misconceptions, is much easier to sway from neutral to positive than from negative to positive. If we waste our time focusing on those negative groups, they're highly fragmented and they have misconceptions that need counteracting and they're anti-science, we are simply wasting our time. So one of the key messages from this talk is I want you to focus on the neutral. 
All right, but then these things happened. You've probably figured out what this is by now. Time for our second poll. Which response do you think is right? In my opinion, I've got to say this is my opinion, I think the Apollo missions actually had a greater influence. It's certainly true that Rachel Carson's Silent Spring birthed the environmental movements and the chemophobic movements, obviously, which spawned out of that. But certainly, uh, I think the Apollo missions had a greater influence, and I'll show you why. So Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was the first book to really demonize chemicals in, uh, in a general sense, not just one particular chemical, but she said that they cause a chain of poisoning and death. This is what she focused on. I've read her book, actually. It's, it's an interesting read. She just focuses really on one chemical, uh, DDT. And uh, really because DDT was really overused. Uh, it's a very powerful insecticide that was just used too much. I mean, there are actually videos on YouTube of children running in the plume of the fun, chasing this car. It, it's really quite worrying uh, how, how liberally it was applied. The one benefit of it is that it eliminates diseases that are born from uh, insects as well. So it eliminates malaria by eliminating basically uh, insects uh, and lice. And you know, there was actually some debate as to whether we should be using this against the Zika virus because it's so effective at wiping out mosquitoes, but that's, uh, that's another topic. The inventor was given a Nobel Prize, but really this is the compound here that was uh, demonized in her book. The photo is this one here, Earthrise. The Apollo mission was actually to go to the moon, but the unintended consequence of that is when they came back from the moon, they saw Earth as a whole for the first time. And that new perspective of Mother Nature, of a planet that's beautiful in its natural state, really changed our thinking. This picture instantly became the number one most defining image of all time. This is the most popular image of all time. And we can see that there's no evidence of human activity. We can't see the wars, the smog that was shrouding cities at that time. We can't see campus unrest. We can't see any of the, the ills that human activity has done to our planet. We can just see that the world is beautiful in its natural state. And we had never seen this image before. The Apollo missions, ironically, gave fuel to the environmental movement on the way home. Neil deGrasse Tyson gives an amazing speech to really back this up. He gives a list of things that happened after that photo was published. The Environmental Protection Agency was founded after that photo was published, just after. The Clean Air Act, the most important rendering of that act, was passed just after the photo was published. Uh, the Catalytic Converter. Uh, DDT gets banned not after the book was published by Rachel Carson, but just after that photo, Earthrise was published. And there's a whole list of environmental events that happened after that photo. Not after the book, but after that. A photo. So pictures of Earth really gave us a profound sense of biophilia. And clearly the flip side of biophilia is a fear of things that are, can, are synthetic. So I would argue that this actually also fed into chemophobia as well. The last one is not necessarily a trigger of something else that was going on, a rejection of modernism. And with it, a that you trust experts to aim for some greater good and you all uh, work together. It's a kind of utilitarian process to get to some greater goal. And postmodernism is the rejection of that. Then is postmodernism also involving the rejection of science? Uh, this is actually a tab tabulated version of a Britannica article on, on postmodernism, and you can see that there's in there multiple versions of the truth. That means that science has actually been relegated in a postmodernist world to just one opinion. And the food babe's opinion is now comparable with the scientific community's opinion. And we see this especially in the climate debate, that, that the opinion of some person is now equated with the opinion of the scientist, and that is also allowing a platform for these, you know, these food bloggers, these, uh, these chemophobic people to come out with a voice. And they are taken with equal weight as scientific truth, which is actually, in a way, quite sad. Uh, so these are the three things I would argue that really fuel chemophobia, but you've also got these. These are some of the disasters. This is the industrial disasters that helps to fuel chemophobia even further. But it's not the disasters themselves that caused chemophobia, it's how they were managed. There are physics disasters every single day. There are more physics disasters than chemistry disasters, including car crashes and all the other accidents that happen around the world. But physics doesn't get a bad reputation. There are more biological disasters. Biology actually kills more people than any other science. I looked through the statistics. If you add them up, chemistry comes out third after biology and physics. So why does chemistry get a bad rap? Well, I think we mismanage the fallout from that. And here's evidence. You can name dozens of biology documentaries, fantastic big budget documentaries. You can name dozens of physics documentaries, including Cosmos. Cosmos had, this is the, the re-release by Neil deGrasse Tyson, it had a 10 channel simultaneous launch in the US global audience. It was introduced by Barack Obama in a 30-second speech about the importance of science for the public. Biology's got David Attenborough. He's had a boat named after him. He's a research vessel. 
there's uh, certainly heroes and documentaries representing biology and uh, physics. Try finding another chemistry documentary. I challenge you to find another chemistry documentary. If you find one, send me the title, tweet it to me. I, I'm honestly looking for another chemistry documentary. I can't find one. There only seems to be one. That chemistry documentary was pretty good. It's actually called Chemistry of Volatile History. One of the problems with it is it focuses on the top, the middle, and the bottom of the periodic table, respectively. And then it stops. That's it. There's only three episodes. Now, for me, the elements are really just getting started. That's where you learn about the building blocks, and then you have to learn through probably 20 more episodes about what those elements can do when they're combined. So for me, starting a chemistry documentary with elements and finishing after three episodes is a bit like having a documentary series on architecture where you talk about this is wood, this is brick, this is stone, and then you just stop. You don't ever talk about the buildings that can be made from it. So really they missed the main part of chemistry in that their host as well, as much as I love him as a communicator, he's doing a brilliant job, but he works for physics. He represents physics. He's a professor of theoretical physics, and there he is standing in front of a board full of physics. So really the take-home message from the only documentary representing chemistry is chemistry is about elements. If you like it, do physics. All right, there's a bit more going on as well. Chemists are trying to uh, debunk some of the myths that people have. This is my effort towards that. Uh, in early 2014, I released these posters, 12 ingredients labels for fruits, and you've probably seen these online. They uh, try to show you that chemistry is everywhere, and there's even a parody of this. There's actually an another parody of this in um, our latest textbook. It's an e-book, so I haven't got a, an image, but it's actually got um, butter and margarine, and they've compared the ingredients list in our chemistry textbook. But there's parodies everywhere. The dose makes poison is another noble effort as well. And we've also got natural isn't safe. The fourth message really tries to erode the distinction between natural and artificial, which of course doesn't really exist, but it is the foundation of chemophobia. The assumption that there are natural and artificial things, natural is good and artificial is bad, is the bedrock of chemophobia. And if we can erode that, we can erode chemophobia. So this is my effort to combat that aspect of chemophobia. My favorite is the watermelon. It used to be a hard nut-like object and you had to crack it open was very bitter and disgusting, but farmers bred that up into modern watermelons. As an educator, I am also partly responsible. This is a typical lab, and I say things like this all the time. Never eat in the lab. Assume everything in the lab is toxic and corrosive. And don't pour that back into the stock solution. That's an interesting one. When, when a student is pouring out a solution from the stock bottle, sometimes they pour too much. Right? They get 60 mils instead of 20. They want to pour it back in. And I say, no, you can't do that, because we have, we have a rule that once you've poured it out of the stock bottle, you're not allowed to put it back in. And they say, why? They say, why? And I say, well, it might be contaminated. And they go, but it's a clean beaker, sir. Yeah, but we still shouldn't have that habit of pouring it back in. Where did the contamination come from? In the student's mind, contamination happened between the stock bottle and the beaker, the five centimeters in which they poured it. Was the contamination in the clean beaker? Was that contaminated? Was the air contaminated? Where was the contamination happening between the stock bottle and the beaker? The students go away with the idea that labs are full of contaminants. Never eat in the lab is another one. It's not surprising that people leave school with the idea that any food that contains chemicals made in a lab would be bad for you when teachers are constantly saying never eat anything in a lab. And it's also not surprising that people go for chemical-free products when we tell students that everything made in a lab you should assume is corrosive and toxic. So chemistry is actually portrayed by teachers sometimes inadvertently through all these safety messages as something that's actually quite dangerous. So I get this comment a lot. I also get this. I've got this up on my wall in my graduation class classroom and the other day I had this asked. Now, technically, that's true, uh, but not in the sense that he's talking about. So what exactly is he talking about? Everybody's watched that. Now, all of the students I teach are 16, 17, 18 years old. They've all seen, basically everyone doing chemistry has seen this show or part of it. This is the best answer we have to all the great physics and biology documentaries. This has had more influence than any other TV documentary on chemistry. And this is the lingering perception that the students are now having of chemistry, that it's, some, that it's about destruction, it's about death, it's about destroying things, it's about doing evil. And, and that is the only image that we are portraying to people. Physics has got Brian Cox and others doing a great job of communicating what physics can do. Biology has got David Attenborough 
and again, doing, he spent his whole life doing an amazing job communicating biology. But we have Walter White, which is something we need to change. We need to actually replace Walter White with somebody a little different, but who? All right, here's your homework. I want you to devote 5% of your time to outreach. Outreach is often misconstrued as something that's kind of a charitable act, that we should dumb our work down and then go play with the public, and that's not really a, not really a good use of scientific time, that our, that our great minds should be better off in the lab, but outreach, as I said earlier, gives you a clarified perspective on uh, what your work means, and the public can give you insights that the scientific community can't. This is what I want you to do with that time. Spend 5%, 5 of your time, by the way, it's two hours a week. 5% of your working time. It's two hours a week working on one of these. So pick one. That's your homework. Pick one and spend two hours a week doing it. I just want to show you one example of this. Participate in science festivals, and these do exist on the East Coast as well. I'll show you some uh, examples of that uh, a little later on, actually. When you're talking to the public, no matter how it is, through books, through tweets, through interviews, through magazines, whatever it is, be passionate and be positive. Be positive about what you do as a person and make sure that you are seen as a human being, not just as a scientist. Speak to the neutral 60% and don't focus on debunking myths. Promote chemistry. People have to debunk myths. They have to fight at the front lines. But as a chemist, as a professional, you should probably focus on promoting chemistry to the 60%, the larger audience. I also want you to abandon the word chemical as a noun, and we can debate this in the Q&A, but we don't really use the word chemical as a noun anyway. When's the last time you referred to a substance as a chemical, as a noun? And I did some words analysis in our textbook here for our graduation class. Chemicals is not even in the top five, so we can abandon the word chemical and replace it with a whole suite of other words without really any major consequences. Because chemical actually has different meanings for us and for the public. The dictionary says it's an artificially prepared substance. The dictionary is not on our side anymore. And when that happens, we really have to give in and say, okay, a chemical is an artificially prepared substance. Not everything is a chemical. We have to really actually stop that message now. and We have to say uh, a chemical is an artificially prepared substance. I'd rather actually just avoid this issue completely and focus on the benefits of chemistry. Use these words instead. Everything in the world can really be described as something other than a chemical, so use another word. Tell stories in chemistry. Make chemistry relevant. What do people care about? They care about energy, safety, climate. They care about the economy. So, so make, re make relevant connections between chemistry and those things, and don't focus on the elements of the periodic table. That's been done. It's been done very, very well, but we really need to build on that and go to the next step, which is molecules. And that's a much bigger, that's a much, much bigger to teach. Focus on cutting edge research as well. Don't focus on the history of chemistry and how the things were discovered. That's been done. Focus on how chemistry is advancing at the very cutting edge. It's an active process. Some examples of outreach which are fantastic. Google ACS reactions and their posters and videos on things like the chemistry of love, the chemistry of dogs, the chemistry of coffee, etc. They're great outreach videos. Periodic videos as well from the UK is fantastic, and Theodore Gray did some great work with his apps and books. I've got both of them, the whole, the whole collection. They're wonderful apps. They're really engaging. You've also got outreach programs from universities, so those of you in education, get involved with those. Help to run the outreach programs in your university, and also help to promote them to schools. If you are a school, get out there and get, get in touch with your universities and say which outreach programs do you have. It's often very easy to get those set up. All right, so there's some great books as well. There are many more out there. But there's one miracle cure for chemophobia. I told you before that we have Walter White representing us at the moment. We need to replace him with somebody much more inspirational. There's a great documentary series which I think serves as creative inspiration for what we could do. It's called A Bite of China. If you haven't watched A Bite of China, you should. Watch season two because in season one they have a, uh, the English is a little, um, it's a little hard to understand, but watch season two. If you, can, if you speak Chinese, watch it in Chinese. It's an amazing documentary. They spent $5 million per series shooting the, the, the most incredible TV series. You don't just learn about food, you learn about local culture and things that you never even realize existed. That's a man farming uh, lotus root right there on the bottom right. We need to do something like this for chemistry. Here's a list of episodes, and this is framed in the same kind of context that A Bite of China focuses on. So this is what we need to do. Doesn't really cost that much money, but we need to get something like this up and running as a chemistry community to really upstage Walter White. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. 
Thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely fantastic. Now, uh, we've had a few answers to your, your own question, in point of fact, about the chemistry uh, documentaries that have been out there. So apparently there were, on HDTV, there's one by Bill Nye called The 100 Greatest Discoveries of Chemistry. We have The Mystery of Matter, which is a four-part series on PBS, which apparently was very good. A series apparently called The World of Chemistry by Roald Hoffman and a PBS Netflix called The Poisoner's Handbook, uh, which mm. I think might have been um, on the ACS um, seminars as well. So uh, I'll give a little shout out for Jim Al-Khalili as well, who, um, <laughs> who, uh, uh, who, who is a fantastic chemistry uh, presenter. So listen, we've got lots of things to get through. First question is from Micah. How can we create a universal symbol for the public that succinctly states safe versus unsafe? So universal symbol, what do you think? A universal symbol, well, there are many suggestions out there. There's a traffic light system, for example, but really the dose makes the poison and we can't give up that message. We have to really embrace that and actually keep that as part of our message. We can't say this is good and that's bad. That's the kind of thing we're really trying to counteract. So there's no one symbol I think we can use, but I think a, we need to build awareness that everything has uh, different responses at different doses. And uh, certainly in the outreach that we do, we should focus that focus on that as one of our key messages, that the dose makes the poison, and focus on the, and tell people examples of what happens at different levels of different exposure. For example, fluoridation of water. What happens if you don't have enough? What happens if you have the right amount? And what happens if you have too much? Every, every substance has a dose response curve, and we need to make that a key message. Yeah, no, I get, I get the point. Actually, the next question is also relevant. This is from Curtis. So, if the public see the word green, or the word organic, what does that generally tend to mean to them? So to a public audience, if they hear the word, what, what does it tend to conjure up in their minds? Well, green seems to be good for the environment, and organic, of course, means for the public that uh, it's not sprayed with pesticides. And there are actually surveys asking people, why do you buy organic? And the number one reason is it's not sprayed with pesticides, but often they are. Uh, again, a mismatch between truth and, and, and the perception of organic crops. By the way, I've, I've given this talk to my own students who essentially are members of the, the public. And when, when I told them that organic crops are sometimes sprayed with pesticides, they didn't really like to hear that. So that's going to be a, a little bit of a difficult fight to have. Green, I think we can all agree on, right? Well, yeah, um, perhaps so, yeah. Okay, this is an interesting one. So if you're trying to combat chemophobia amongst your friends, and your social circle and so on, can you sort of put across any best practice guidelines? And you mentioned one already, just avoid the word chemical as a noun, but uh, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so you do see a lot of this, especially on social media. That's where I think we as chemists come across chemophobia. Debunk the, the claims that are made, leave a comment, but don't let it work you up really. Do question their meaning. When they say this, is con this contains a chemical, just say, what exactly do you mean by that? And just probe their understanding a little deeper. Eventually, you'll find they don't really know what they're referring to. So just just say, what exactly do you mean by this contains chemicals? Which chemicals are you referring to? And, and, and the discussion usually degenerates uh, to the point that they don't actually know. At that point, they've realized they don't really know what they're talking about. So just probe deeper, I would say. Don't immediately refute the argument. Just kind of debunk it by just probing deeper and seeing what they actually mean. Uh, it's a bit more of a respectful approach, and I think that would actually work better. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so this is one about in the movies. This is from Jennifer. Jennifer, thanks for your question. Positive and negative presentation in the movies. Who gets it right? Who gets it wrong? So uh, she's particularly mentioned The Martian with recycled water mm -hmm. and then uh, Erin yep. Brockovich uh, with contaminated water. So, any movies sticking out in your, in your mind for this one? The Martian was fantastic. Yeah, that did, uh, that did great things. James Bond movies. I did an analysis of the Bond villains, all of them, and plotted whether their threats were biological, chemical, or physical. And what's interesting is there was a blip, like a peak, of chemical threats around 1990 in Bond movies. And it coincides with, key, with essentially a little peak of chemophobia, interestingly. If you go to Google Trends, there was a little peak in uh, the fear of chemicals around that time as well. So I don't know if there's a connection there. But we do need better representation of chemicals and chemistry in all aspects. And that requires a general public who uh, is generally more aware and more appreciative of chemistry. Absolutely. Right, this is from Megan. To what degree is chemophobia related to fear-mongering in general? It mentions the US election at the moment, then um, is there any overlap in the methods and best practices for combating these uh, phobias? Well, absolutely. There's a lot of parallels with the uh, election. 
But just as an outside observer, the election this year is fascinating in the US. Most interestingly, because opinion is now fact. Opinion can be, you know, you can make stuff up. I mean, this, this is true in every election to some extent, but you, you can say something that's just not true and people will believe it. The, the opinion is now taken with equal weighting as science. Other parallels, yes, there have been uh, studies that show people who are chemophobic actually are more, this is the Royal Society study actually, the Royal Society of Chemistry, they showed that people who are more chemophobic actually fear things in general. It's not that they're picking out chemophobia, they are just more fearful in general. And then they probed why. They looked at the particular media they consume, the newspapers they read, the TV that they watch, and they found that the particular channels and newspapers they chose to watch and read were generally more fearful. I, I'm sure you have this in the US as well, where certain channels focus on fear stories much more than others. And the people who watched them were generally scared of everything, not just chemicals. So they're not singling out chemistry at all. The people with chemophobia t be fearful of a lot more than just chemicals. I, I have a colleague, a um, countryman of yours actually, um, uh, Professor Karen Douglas. I'll give her a little shout out. She, uh, she specializes in conspiracy theories and uh, a lot of the conclusions that you've just mentioned there are uh, very common to, to her research. And the commonalities between these things that people will believe and not believe uh, really come out in, in that. I'm also very interested in what you're saying about you know, opinion over fact. Yeah, this becomes more and more of a problem. It's almost as though the more loudly and, and outrageously people come out with things, the more likely they are to be believed, and mentioning no That's names, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is sadly true, yes. Uh, and this election cycle has really proved that. Right, excellent. So, listen, this next one, I'm going to put out a, a little health warning here. The opinions that expressed of the questioner are not necessarily those of ACS webinars or indeed um, uh, any of us individually. So I'll read it out, and it's an interesting one. But this is from Mauricio. So he says, how can we control the frantic and self-serving outreach of scientists, chemists, and others to the public news and, and news media to talk about inconclusive research that only adds to the fear of science and innovation. So interestingly, would, would you challenge his view that there are self-serving scientists um, doing outreach and then talking about this inconclusive research and perhaps creating a little bit of fear in that particular way? Well, firstly, on the outreach, there are lots of people uh, who are doing it and uh, self-serving, um, it can be used in a self-serving way. I mean, universities can use it to say boost their admissions numbers and boost their rankings indirectly. But, you know, to be honest, most outreach uh, should not be really promoted by that. And that's why we really need to promote outreach for its own good, to benefit the long longevity of our industry and to benefit the, the funding ultimately that people, from, from politicians that people elect. So, so there is a vested interest that we have as an industry together uh, to promote outreach. And, and yes, some people will, will use it for their own selfish purposes, but really, I don't think that's a majority at all. That, that's a small sector. Your second part to the question, well, this is where people need to understand and we need to really promote science as a, as a process. And, and this goes right back to school. It goes right back to the, the major uh, TV shows that we need to promote science as a, as a journey of discovery that the theories change all the time and that's okay. And, and the best evidence we have right now will, will form our theories and opinions right now. I think scientists, when we write papers, are doing the right thing. You know, using the words like this doesn't prove anything conclusively. But I think what the question is maybe getting at is the kind of existential crisis that science has been slightly exposed to in the last couple of years. We had psychology, the field of psychology couldn't have any reproducible studies. Basically, they found it was very difficult to reproduce studies consistently uh, across different labs and, and possibly across other branches of science as well. So, but that's where meta-analyses come into play. So, so meta-analyses play a great role in sort of weeding out uh, what is a false positive from what is actually uh, something worth pursuing. So all of this is really about in engaging with the public and building an awareness of science as a journey of discovery. You take the whole body of evidence, not just from one particular paper. Uh, absolutely. Elizabeth is asking, you know, basically we see no scientists among chemophobic groups. So do you know of any prominent scientists who have chemophobic groups? <laughs> I, uh, scientists know, science teaches, yes, which is interesting. <laughs> I won't go into detail, but yes, and I don't know how you can reconcile the two. I honestly don't know, uh, but I think they're a rare breed. Yeah, I and mean, where would you go with that? I mean, can you, can you imagine a chemist who was also a, a, a chemophobic? That would be, that would be interesting <laughs> in and of itself, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would be, yeah. Okay. They're in the wrong yeah. industry. 
so I, I, I like this one. This is from Robert, and thanks for your question, Robert. So this is a, almost a personal question in some way. Have you personally helped alleviate uh, someone's chemophobia? So without naming names, of course. So what do you do that works, if so? Have I helped to alleviate someone's chemophobia? That's a really interesting point. Uh, on a personal level, I certainly had discussions and I've tried to combat it, um, but I don't think I've ever cured anyone of chemophobia. I actually don't think it's really possible to bring anyone from the negative category up to the positive to liking science. I mean, you can debunk these claims, but as we saw, their theories just mutate, they just mutate and evolve, their theories. Their, their prejudice, their intent on being against chemicals or whatever it is, and if you, it's like whack-a-mole, you know, you knock out one theory, they just come up with another one. And actually, I was looking at the whole clean eating phenomenon, and they were saying it's in a way, clean eating is actually, I didn't put this in the presentation, but clean eating is a, is a new kind of a health food phenomenon. It encompasses a whole range of fat diets or um, uh, orthorexia, I think they call it, where it's, you're supposed to eat this and not that. It encompasses all types of sort of chemophobic diets. So this, is, this, this particular chemical is bad. There was just a documentary, I was watching this on uh, the other day in the UK, where um, they're actually trying to treat this type of chemophobia as a mental health issue. So, so it's actually very difficult to treat, to convert somebody from chemophobia back into the neutral category, which is why I say, uh, as chemists, don't don't waste your great minds on doing that. Focus on the neutral category. Try to bring them back into the positive. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Well, I don't often read out comments, but uh, I particularly like this one. This is from Matthew Loopman, and he says, uh, a really good physics TV icon is Sheldon Cooper. So, uh, <laughs> Big Bang Theory uh, fans out there, but uh, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Big Bang Theory. Right, what else have, have we got here? So, this is from Roger. Are chemists themselves adequately informed about the potential health effects of particular chemicals, of positive and, and negative? In his opinion, many aren't, and they can sort of unwittingly become the major promoters of chemophobia, in Roger's opinion. So, what do you think to that? That's a very interesting point. There's an interesting article called Chemophobia, a Chemist's Construct. I think it's by Lorch, I think, in the UK. The, the, don't quote me on that. I think it, but it's, uh, it's a very interesting idea that chemists have caused chemophobia in various ways like the, the question has suggested. So we certainly have training in safety of chemicals, but we only understand the safety of chemicals because we understand the scientific process and we understand the dose-response curve. Another sort of piece of food for thought is there are different dose responses. And there's a whole branch of, especially uh, among certain scientists, about hormesis. I don't know if you've looked at hormesis. It seems to be a bit of a niche branch of, of, of chemistry or biochemistry where they look at those response curves that can be beneficial or, or negative. So you can have a small dose where something's beneficial and a large dose where it becomes negative. And, uh, and I think we don't, we don't really address issues like that. When we do toxicology, we actually just assume a linear or a threshold dose. I'm not saying there is or isn't any scientific basis for this, but it's an avenue worth pursuing that I don't think we've really addressed as chemists. Uh, and that might be something that could sway the public into understanding dose response curves a little bit better. Okay, so this is sort of on the same, uh, same theme really. So this is from Gillian. So Gillian is a science teacher herself, and she is asking, what, what advice do you have to sort of strike that balance between focusing on life lab safety without scaring your students away from chemistry? Yeah, well, you can't turn down the safety message, for example, right? It's a legal requirement of my job to make sure that students know the sulfuric acid concentrate is very, very hazardous. And I actually call it death juice. When we're making esters, I show them the death juice catalyst. It's concentrated <laughs> H2SO4. And I get a piece of paper and I say, can somebody give me a page out of their notebook? And we, and we pour it on the paper and burn a hole in it. And, uh, and I show them that's what it would do to your skin. This is why you need to wear gloves, and they go, does it burn through the gloves? So you have to, you can't tone down the safety message, you have to keep that up, but at the same time, you have to counter it with purification. You have to teach them that things can be purified, and that's something we never do in school. We made aspirin in school. Uh, we made large amounts of aspirin, actually, and then uh, they say, oh, sir, can I eat it? No, you can't. Why not? Because it's contaminated with all sorts of other byproducts. We don't know what they are. We've got to throw it away. What, what a waste, and that's the response. But what we have to do is then show them how it can be purified, either through an actual purification step as an experiment or just the, at least the theory. So yeah, don't tone down the safety message. That's irresponsible. Don't be reckless with chemicals. Show them the safety, but also show them the purification and show them how industries would make the aspirin and purify it. And, uh, and then I think they'll have a bit more trust in, uh, in the safety of chemicals. Thank you for watching this presentation. 
ACS Webinars is provided as a service by the American Chemical Society as your professional source for live weekly discussions and presentations that connect you with subject matter experts and global thought leaders concerning today's relevant professional issues in the chemical sciences, management, and business.